been with us. Okay. Well, thank you again for everyone for joining us this afternoon. The structure of this event will first be introductions, uh, then a program with Ruth Dennis, and lastly, some time to take questions and comments. If you have any technical difficulties, feel free to uh, type in your concern in the chat box. Uh, we'll assist you there. To ask a question or make a comment, please feel free to raise your hand to be unmuted, or you can type it in the chat box or Q&A box, um, and we will address your question and comment at the appropriate time. Let me introduce you to Ruth Dennis. In her decades as a caregiver, Ruth Dennis witnessed the tragic results of the medicalized and institutionalized way of caring for people with dementia. And equally cl clearly, she saw a better way. Mindful dementia care illustrates alternative methods for making a difference and achieving results through care that honors the whole person. The key is creating an environment with countless enriching touchstones to the inner person through facilities that are filled with art, animal companions, music, dance, books, laughter, and, the wholes and wholesome food. It is an approach that embraces creative and artistic processes to shape a more loving spiritual approach for elders and their families. Ruth Dennis has worked in mental health, the arts, and community education for over 25 years, she is a certified dementia practitioner and for the past two decades has worked closely with palliative um, care hospice and grief support. Central to Ruth's life is her role as a carega caregiver to her brother Morgan, who has Down syndrome. He is the bravest man she has ever known. Please welcome Ruth Dennis. Thank you guys so much. Um, it is really, really an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to start out by telling everybody how the book came about. I've been working with Vista Living Care for 23 years. I was also a family caregiver for 23 years for my brother Morgan. Um, Morgan had Down syndrome. He passed away in 2019. As Morgan's health changed, I got really tired and decided that to support being his caregiver, it was time to shift the way I was working at Vista. I was blessed to be in an ecosystem, in a way of care, caring, that believed that was a good, that was supported of that. So for about 10 years before we'd bounced around the idea of we should write a book. We've written forewords for other people's books. Um, we know we live with dementia every day. Um, how can we support people with this? So I shifted to write the book and the book ended up being a discussion of stories, a collection of stories about dementia and caregiving and about a different way to approach dementia. Um, you say Alzheimer's, you say dementia. The first narrative that comes up is the tragedy piece, is the, you know, Alzheimer's sucks piece. And there's a lot more to it than that. Um, there's a lot more to it for families. There's a lot more to it for elders facing this. And there's room for joy and creativity and connection to life. And the book ended up being about all of the above, that it's possible to really see and help people deal with the tough stuff, with the disease process stuff, with the stuff that we can't be but it's also possible to get beyond it and have joy and hope and challenge. And what I'm gonna do today is 
talk about dementia care, but also read some pieces from the book about that. I think one of the things we can't get away from is the journey. And the journey for me with dementia care with started almost the same time as caregiving for my brother. My father passed away and my brother moved in with me. A couple months later, I was diagnosed with cancer. And during that whole process, realized that there were a couple of people who really made an impression on how I thought about what families needed. Um, one was with VISTA, the other was medical. But the impression was the same thing. What I needed and what I hit the lottery with getting was what I think and what has become part of VISTA, part of the book, part of how we, the ecosystem of care is, what do you need? You need somebody to listen to you. You need somebody to talk to you and be honest, but also to be really compassionate. You need somebody to pay attention, pay attention to the details, pay attention to the process. And most of all, you need people around you who are going to walk with you through the whole journey of care. That fused into the work that I did at VISTA because dementia is a process. And right now, there's not a cure for this process. It's a process that also affects the whole family everybody's on this journey together. And looking at that process and trying to be the people that are on the journey of care with someone with dementia from the very beginning through the end, through the whole process and pay attention to those details, led Vista into becoming the only program in New Mexico that has joined the Eden Alternative. And the Eden Alternative came out of a doctor from Yale, Bill Thomas, who, when he was doing his practicum and when he was learning to be a doctor, ended up working in a large nursing home in New York City. And figured out that his patients were dying from loneliness, helplessness, and boredom and spent the rest of his life is still working on it. Figuring out how to solve that um, makes a whole lot of sense with us at VISTA. And so what we've done is we've talked about how and created ways to connect care with life, animals, plants, art, music, good food, somebody to hold your hand, somebody to stay with you. And that's what makes a difference. I'm going to read a couple little pieces of the book um, that are about kind of why the book came about and about Alzheimer's. And it comes out of a chapter called Dementia 101, getting, finding facts and getting beyond them. And getting beyond Alzheimer's sucks. And this is, this is the section. Ruth, some things just suck. In 1999, an oncologist would tell me these things before I started chemo. And this would help me beat cancer. The words really helped me. They came with a deeply honest and compassionate discussion of the help I needed. And that even though I did not have insurance or money at the time, I had one choice to make, fight and live or wait and die. I would spend more than a year fighting and more than 10 years dealing with the financial piece of this. But it was worth it. I love my life. The time with my brother, the work I have done, the people I have loved, 
all the painting and gardening that would not have happened without facing the sucks part. Honesty kept me alive. So why does the story end up being part of a book about dementia and caregiving? A t-shirt I got a long time ago from a caregiver conference actually reads, all summer sucks. The truth is any progressive dementia sucks. This is not a cynical, hopeless, or jaded statement. This simply is true. The process is tough and currently ultimately fatal to the person facing it. It is a struggle for everyone around them, everyone who loves this person. There will be tears and anger. There will be fatigue. And there is currently no cure. However, there is still life in the process. Love, joy, and yes, hope. Hope in the face of death. Joy in the face of sheer terror. Love in the deepest, toughest, bravest, pure, purest form. Yes, this disease sucks. Now it's time to move beyond it. Face it, move beyond it. Change the system. And that is essentially what we've committed ourselves to, is how do we change the system? How do we change the way of care? How do we make another path for care? What I've learned from the elders that I work with and the caregivers that I work with. And I think this is really, really, especially after the past year and a half with COVID, is there are so many people around us that are heroes in a whole lot of ways that are changing how we view what people need. Um, the basics with Alzheimer's and with any progressive dementia are simple. The brain changes, the people's ability to function change, um, short-term memory, logic, reason, all that changes. The brain and the body stop communicating and the people have more tendency to fall or eat less, or become incontinent. That's the suck side. That's the tough piece. The other piece of Alzheimer's is something different. And it's the piece that makes people heroes. It's the creativity, the openness, the sense of being able to lose yourself in making a drawing or dancing or listening to music or petting, an, petting a dog or watching children play. There's a real, real tendency in our society to not value people that need help. And the truth is my brother, the elders I work with are all people that needed help in really basic core ways. They're also all people who were creative and brave and smart. And I'm gonna read a little bit and introduce you guys to some of my here, a couple of my heroes. They're elders that we worked with. Um, their names are Frankie and Joan. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit of their story. Frankie sang all the time for years, almost any song you could think of. She knew all the gospel songs and all the drinking songs. After a while, the lyrics got a bit odd, but she would sing anyway. Frankie was a loyal friend. She was demanding and she could be a bit of a princess at times, aren't we all? Every man who met her just adored her. I wish I could pull that one off. I came down the hall one day at work to find Frankie singing a hundred bottles of beer on the wall with a local priest. They were both laughing. Frankie always tried to be 
to do everything except for exercise. Eye rolling was her favorite form of exercise and physical activity. She was always the first to arrive at any party and she was usually the last to leave. She always started every conversation by taking your hand and saying, I like you, I love you. It's a good place to start. Even if you disagree with somebody, it's a really good place to start. She believed in speaking her mind and she did so with charm. She was always proud of her children. They somehow became the perfect kids as she got older. Hair and makeup were appreciated, manicures were not. Frankie met the last nine years of her life with Alzheimer's in her own terms. Her terms were music, stubbornness, friendship, and as much chocolate as possible. Frankie lived at Sierra Vista. She was part of the process of us joining the Eden Alternative. She also helped pick the first goats and chickens. Um, and she was amazing and she was a hero. And it was an honor to be a part of something that gave her the chance to be that, to be who she was in her skin. The next hero I'm gonna introduce you to is named Joan. And Joan lived at Sierra Vista as well. For more than a year, Joan drew every day. Hundreds and hundreds of pages, webs of spirals, making, making and colors in wild, curious worlds. These drawings became her novel, her obsession, her home. She created a world to go to when worlds, words failed her, when there were no words. This world would sometimes spill over onto bed sheets and pillowcases and walls. Our caregivers and her family kept her in really good supplies. She had good tools to work with. They would set up her materials, remind her to eat and drink, make sure she had snacks and drinks so that she could bring herself out of her world and be healthy and safe. And they would be there. Our staff created an artist in Joan. Joan was somebody who loved what she became. And she became this, not in spite of dementia, but because of it. And this is a big, big piece to the story. Her drawings reminded me of the Da Vinci drawings, the flood drawings, and they were incredibly beautiful and detailed, but they were also kind of a visual picture of what it felt like to be drowning. And really beautiful. Her husband and Joan gave permission to me to use the drawings for training and teaching. And the students would look at the drawings, they would look at her journals. And first they would smile and then they would cry. And then they would just be joyous because what they saw was, they saw that this woman facing this disease, losing her ability to speak, created an entire world and this world was beautiful and it was sad and scary and funny but it was hers and she created it every elder that i've worked with over more than 20 years has the ability to find that world to find their purpose joan defined herself as an artist 
Frankie defined herself as a singer and a friend. They were heroes. Another set of heroes are families who deal with this, who kind of watch someone they love change over the years. And also the people around them, the people providing care, the people who are partners on that journey. All these people are heroes. Um, during COVID, I watched caregivers even risk their own lives to care for people. Um, it's a very, very deep honor. You know, the caregivers that I work with are goddesses in a lot of ways, and they change the world. I think one of the things that happens on a society level with dementia is we want to minimize. We want to hold so much onto the tragedy and the loss that we forget what people can, can contribute and how people can laugh and have joy and change people's lives. And when we forget that, we forget them as human beings. And a lot of what this book is about is how do you reconnect with people as human beings? How do you create life as, for people as human beings? One of the things, and it did kind of chapter in pieces, and, and I have to just say this, but this, if you're writing a book, editors are beautiful, editors are wonderful, because what an editor did for us is we all kind of spoke the same language because we worked in healthcare for so long. And what an editor did is it took kind of our circular thinking and made it into actual chapters that made sense for other people. And the chapters touch on different topics and different parts of the process. And one of the chapters we did was on sexuality. And part of the reason for doing this is that there's a tendency to look at people with dementia and think that the relationships they form are not real relationships. And the truth is they are. I've had a couple of elders, a um, couple sets of elders at Vista who've fallen in love. They've been, and it was a real relationship. They loved each other and it was a positive thing. It wasn't dirty old man or dirty old woman or someone who need medica needed medication or needed to see a psychiatrist. It was two people who loved each other. And I think we need to keep that in our heads and keep that with a level of respect. The blessing that we had with one of the couples is that the families got it. They listened, they watched them, and they saw how positive it could be. And so this is a story about a couple that I worked with, Jose and Maliki. And this is their story. We worked with two families from very different backgrounds who became close because their parents became a couple. In a world without Alzheimer's, these two elders might never have met. He was a minor, she was a doctor. He was divorced and widowed, a lapsed Catholic with two sons and a daughter-in-law who was his guardian angel. She raised six children, create, created family practice clinics and was a devoted Methodist. They were Jose and Malike. Their families both had the wisdom and the respect to honor the choice that their parents made. The families would sit together at holidays. They became one big Dutch, Northern New Mexico Hispanic family for a few years. Malike's youngest baby girl was her best friend and caregiver. Jose's daughter-in-law was very, very happy. 
that he had found a nice lady in his life. Despite dementia, three languages, eight children, and God knows how many grandchildren, they loved one another and they were a positive influence on their lives. He reminded her to drink more water. She scolded him when he tried to skip his medication or he didn't want to shave. She wasn't a fan of beards. He almost always laughed at what she said. He, and he almost always did what she asked him to, even if it was take medication. She kept him awake during church. He told her stories in English and Spanish that made her laugh. She was a good listener. And she, was all, she made sure he stayed polite. He would call her his old lady. She would elbow him and laugh and whisper to him in Dutch. He had no idea what she was saying, but it always made him smile. They were always near each other. They made, made each other more calm and happy. When she passed away suddenly, he changed. Something inside him that had held off the dementia and the confusion began to let go. He was never as strong after that. They're both gone now. I'm grateful to have been a small part in the time they had together. I will always be grateful that I had the chance to know them. I will always be proud of our home and of their families for accepting the two of them as a real relationship. I am proud to be part of a place I love rules. That's the Jose and Malike story. That is part of what is getting beyond the Alzheimer's sex. The other part is how do we change it? How do we make a new system and have a new conversation? Some of that comes down to changing the ecosystem of care, changing how we look at care. The traditional model of dementia is think of an umbrella. And the umbrella is the disease is the, the disease process. It's all the symptoms and all the problems. And the little raindrops coming off it are the different diseases. I would like to change that image. I would like that image to go away. I think of dementia as a tree. I use the example of the Aspen forest in that you've got roots, causes effect. You've got the soil that is for good or bad the rest of us, our society, what we how we look at elders. You've got the trunk, which is dementia. It's it's the it's the symptoms and the processes. All the branches are disease processes, the leaves are experiences. But that tree doesn't exist in the void. It exists connected to everybody around it, and it exists in an ecosystem. The ecosystem that I write about in the book, I and mean, the ecosystem that every that everybody I have worked with and everybody I do work with right now are trying to build is one that supports and maintains connection that tries to stand with one another. I'm gonna do my last little bit of reading is about that, is about the ecosystem. And the chapter is called Care First, Love, Love Rules. It's funny when we look at elder homes, we don't spend much time talking about what really makes a home. We look at fixtures and amenities and staffing and emergency procedures and room size and equipment and technology. 
that conversation needs to change. A home is made or destroyed by the people in it. I am not opposed to rate proof fixtures or to technology. They can be great tools in the right hands. But these things, no matter how far or how fascinating they may be, things don't make a relationship. They don't make a home. They're not a connection to life. Homes evolve over time to reflect the people who live in them. Homes change. Home is where people feel safe. Home is where you can be who you actually are. Maybe your conversations about elder care should begin with relationships. Do caregivers feel heard when they have concerns? Do they know the elders, not as a diagnosis, room number, or occupancy, but as human beings? Is there a deep commitment to the day-to-day hands-on care that someone facing dementia will need? Or is care just another reason to raise fees? Is Alzheimer's being discussed in an honest way, in a compassionate way? Or is the structure of the entire system built on denying this disease and therefore denying the person? The relationship between someone who needs help and someone who gives help is complex. This relationship is human and loving, and it can enrich both people's lives. It can also be mechanical and neglectful. Carol is our executive director at Sierra Vista and Vista Living Care. She describes her version of what this means. Love connects us all. We draw strength from the energy that we create together. I love being in this work because our differences make us look for similarities in one another. No matter how often we, how broken we may feel, there's strength in coming together that makes us whole again. Caregiving completes me. That was her definition of, of doing care, of being an executive director. The day-to-day relationships among elders, caregivers, and friends, families, and the community that they are in are what's important to to our Sierra Vista, our Vista Echo system. The only rule is love. The most important commitments is caring. Carol's description reminds me of the Aspen Forest that we talked about in the beginning of the book. It is the connection, the tangled roots that matter. And forgive my vision. To be strong in the face of life-threatening challenges, we need each other. Pretty perfect boxes don't care for people. People do. The aspens survive wind, cold, rain, drought, heat, and snow. They stand by one another, growing from shared roots. Some die while others sprout and grow. Elders live with the beauty in the face of pain and death. Caregivers stand, hold space, and give care. Something beautiful happens, something real and beautiful. And deeply, deeply feel that this is the discussion we need to have. I'm gonna have Jessica pull up a couple, a few slides, a couple of pictures. And we're gonna talk about creativity with these slides. This is a picture of a group of elders working on a mandala drawing. And it's a process of pulling color and light from darkness. Um, It's also a group process. So it's like having a conversation in a drawing. 
one of the things that happens really, really early on for a lot of people as they face Alzheimer's or any other dementia is it gets harder and harder to make connections. And art, music, animals become ways of making that connection. So this is one example. I'll have her pull another slide. As we have three different ones. This is a mural. Um, this was started shortly before COVID really hit and finished during COVID. It's four foot by eight foot. And it was done by seven elders at Vista Hermosa. One of our homes, uh, 14 elders, really neat, neat little place. But out of the seven elders that worked on it, four of them were on hospice. The mural ended up being about being alive and being really, really connected to the process of beauty and painting. And I'll have Jessica put up the finished product, the finished mural. That's the finished mural. The title of this piece is Rebirth. And it's about trying to find your roots and trying to start over again. Um, I think a very, very unbelievably appropriate mural to be done during COVID. I think it says a lot about how to start over again, but also just the sheer power of what elders can do. Of the seven people who worked on this, four were on hospice, two were functionally nonverbal. Everybody needed help with their daily life. Um, everybody needed help showering. Most people needed help in the bathroom, but they can paint a mural that's four by eight foot. Um, I think it's a really good way to kind of close what we're doing because one of the things that there are gifts to dementia, as much as dementia sucks, there are also gifts. And the gifts can be being able to lose yourself in a flower or petting a dog or holding someone's hand or dancing or flirting or just having a life. And elders can learn and they can grow. Um, a gentleman I worked with learned Spanish while he had a traumatic brain injury and vascular dementia. So thank you guys very much. I'm going to open this up for questions and conversation. Thank you, Ruth. Um, well, first, I want to say that um, Margaret uh, wrote that her dad was privileged to be at Sierra Vista for three and a half years and was under the care of um, you. She calls you a heroine and your staff. Um, she wrote, God bless dear Ruth, she is a gem. Um, Kimber, Kim says, uh, what creative suggestions do you have for sight impaired elders? Actually, really, really interesting there are some really interesting ways to do it. One is to think of the senses as a way to connect to people. Um, so think of touch, think of different textures. Um, fabric can be helpful, but also sound, you know, music, the birds singing. Also have worked with elders where you, some sight impaired people do draw and paint, but they do it kind of as, well, you're following emotion, kind of you're, you're dancing or you're holding hands and you're, you're, you're moving a marker or a paintbrush, but a lot with texture. I think one of the, one of the ways, and, and I'm gonna do kind of a call out to Vista in general, and to, you know, to my boss, because he's actually willing to buy supplies and, 
and helped write the book and has a soul about this. One of the things that we really train staff on is to be aware of the five senses. Taste, good food, touch, animals to pet, fabrics to hold, you know, someone to hold your hand, someone to be, you know, someone to give you a hug if you've had a bad day. Sound, music, being aware of when sounds overwhelming. Um, also having access to nature sounds, to running water, to birds singing in the yard, to goats, to chickens clucking. Um, you know, sight. We have art supplies. You know, we have real art supplies. We have big windows. The elders actually helped design Sierra Vista when we did the remodeling and came up with the idea of putting everything around the central outdoor courtyard. That came from one of the elders. Um, and to just really, really, and, and really be aware of the senses. We use massage aromatherapy both by rubbing people's feet before they get ready for bed and, and hand massage as a way to kind of bring people back into their bodies in a non-threatening way, um, to connect people to life. Does that help? <laughs> I think that's all very helpful. Um, Carol writes, I can't thank you enough for your presentation. I love that you share what you know, your experience and share your heart with great appreciation, Carol and Moore. Thank you. And you've gotten other thank yous from a, a lot of folks. So thank you so much, Ruth. Um, here's a question, Karen writes, hi, I'm wondering how we can start some of these meaningful experiences for someone earlier in the dementia stage. My mother is still living semi-independently in her own place. She doesn't have anything to do most days, and I'd love to try to help her do something creatively or work with animals, but I work full time, I'm a parent, and I'm usually addressing her practical needs. Are there resources in Santa Fe for these kind of experiences for elders who are not yet in an assisted living home? There, there actually are. And, and I'm going to give you two of the best resources in Santa Fe, I know, for folks earlier on. One is the Memory Care Alliance with David Davis. Um, they have a Friday support group that, and, and he hates the word support group, and I kind of get why. But it's a Friday group to meet and have games and talk and be both with someone who's a caregiver and someone with dementia. There's another program started by Yuta Lofig, who is one of the founders of the Dementia Possibilities Conference, but is kind of, please forgive me for but the fairy godmother of Alzheimer's in Santa Fe. Um, but what the Alzheimer's Cafe is, is it's a social time. You can drop someone off with dementia and they can join in into art or music or whatever's going on that day um, and look it up online, look up the Alzheimer's Cafe. I think another piece is to really, as a family caregiver, because you have got a lot on your plate, is to reach out for support. Um, Carolyn Moore is in this group, I'm in this group. We're both in involved in VISTA's very supportive of a group called Stress Busters, um, because it's a way to really help families deal with their lives too. What we have always told caregivers, and one of the reasons that me taking time to write the book was so important, is as a caregiver, you can't give what you ain't got you've got to take care of yourself. So find out where you fit in this puzzle, not just where your mom and your kids do. Thank you. And um, uh, who was the director? Um, 
uh, at the Memory Care Alliance. What was their name? David Davis. Okay. Um, for someone who is um, their parent or grandparent is new to uh, or recently started getting dementia and say the person is maybe afraid or it's very um, startling to as a child or grandchild. Do you have any advice of um, how to begin approaching this? Um, it's, it can be very, um, you know, earth shattering to just sort it's, of lose who they were or them not remember you. Any advice for that? Uh, there, there are a few. One is um, knowledge is power. The more you know about the process, the more you know about the disease, the better your choices are going to be and the less scary it's going to be. Um, there's really, really good um, information online. Um, there's also support groups are a really good thing. Um, I would also, you know, be willing to call and and I'm going to put kind of a, a clause in with this. Call someone from an assisted living and ask questions. And point blank, if they're not willing to talk to you and answer your questions, you should probably call somebody else because they're not going to be helpful. They're not going to do a good job. Um, I really, really, Carolyn, Yolanda at Sierra Vista, uh, Amanda and Dolores at Vista Hermosa, Blanca, down, Blanca and Monica down on Las Cruces, call them, ask questions. Not necessarily about the assisted living, but about dementia. They live with it every day. Um, also, memory cafes, really, really good you know, way to get started. As a family, if somebody doesn't remember you, if they don't remember your name, it may not matter. What matters is that somewhere, and this is kind of a heart thing, they know you're somebody who loves them and they know you're somebody who's safe. So in kind of a deeper soul way, they do remember you. They just may have the wrong relationship with you. Um, funny story, but also sad, but I had a son come into my office one time at Sierra Vista sobbing, crying. And his mom had made a pass at him, pretty, pretty direct pass. How we dealt with it is we found a picture of his father at the same age, and they could have been twins, and a hand mirror, and got him to realize that mom was expressing love for her husband, not for him. The end result was son, son realized that his parents had this really amazing relationship and that he should be proud of it. And he also started taking his wife out on more date nights. Um, so, you know, there's this kind of beautiful time warp world that can be really scary if you're not in it. But in their heart and their soul, they know you love them. And names aren't relevant. The couple who fell in love at Sierra Vista could not remember each other's name, <laughs> but they were very happy. Uh, so, so adjust. You know, one day they're, you're going to be their daughter. The next day you'll be their college roommate. The following day you might be their grandmother, and that's okay. Thank you. That is really helpful and sweet. Um, Allison, sorry, I don't see. Oh, Allison Nathan said that um, they can also work with people um, through solutions. Um, Kitty uh, wrote in their, their information in the chat, um, free online monthly caregiver support group. Yes. Thank you so much. This is awesome. And, and I'm going to give Kitty a call out. She is really, really good at connecting families with resources. So is Yolanda Ray at Sierra Vista. Thank you. Um, 
Catherine Lee writes, where is the book available? Amazon. You can also, best way to access it is through our website, um, www.vistaliving.com. Um, you can also visit um, Ruth's website, mindfuldementiacare.com, and you'll find the what you need to find the book there as well. I put that in the chat box. Um, if there's any more questions or comments, feel free to raise your hand or write it in the chat or Q&A box now. But a million times, thank you, Ruth. This is wonderful. Thank you for providing this event and sharing your knowledge with our community. Um, I know it's uh, really important to me and really important um, to those who came today. And um, we've got a lot of requests to watch the recording later. Um, well, so I can't thank you enough. One other, one other piece with dementia is don't be afraid to have fun. Don't be afraid to be silly or tell bad jokes or dance badly or sing badly or you know, think about what makes life good for you. Uh, I think one of the pieces that both family caregivers and professional caregivers need to remind themselves is that we kind of need the same things as the people we're caring for. We need enough sleep. We need enough to drink. You know, we need, we need plenty of water. We need good tasting food. We need sunshine. We need plants and music and laughter. And as a family caregiver, you've got to keep that stuff in your own life, too. You've got to take care of yourself. Because you can't be with somebody through the journey without finding a way to be healthy. And, and it's not a failure to get help. Even if it does mean calling the assisted living, which nobody wants to do, or calling the nurse or God forbid the doctor, um, you know, but get help. Don't be afraid of it. Promise we don't bite. You don't seem like you bite. You're so welcoming. <laughs> Thank you for everything. Thank you for your wisdom. Um, uh, the, Oh, Carol writes, I tell my caregivers that now is the time to bring out your inner actor or actress. It will be appreciated. I think that's true. There, there's somebody that, and I'm going to, as, as a writer, you probably shouldn't be recommending other people's books in, in your own class, but there is a poet. His name is Gary Glasner. He started the Alzheimer's Poetry Project. If you can find things on YouTube or video, probably one of the best person I know at bringing out their inner actor or actress. Um, there is a performance piece to engaging with somebody with Alzheimer's. You have to go to their world. It's also important to return to your own, but you do have to go to their world. You're not gonna drag them to yours. Thank you, Ruth. Um, everyone, be sure to check out more of our Santa Fe Public Library events um, and uh, check out Ruth's book, Mindful Dementia. Thank you so much for being here, everyone, and a million times thank you, Ruth. Thank you. Everyone, take care. Stay safe and read books. Bye. Bye.